Um, good morning, everyone, at least for those on the West Coast. It may be uh, already or almost afternoon elsewhere. Uh, but uh, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I was assigned to speak about pediatric soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, and this is a really sort of vast topic, uh, but I would fly through the information um, and uh, let's see uh, how much we can get done. Um, so um, for I'm going to speak mainly about rhabdomyosarcoma, the clinical approach and standard treatments and ongoing frontline and upcoming frontline clinical trials. Uh, the, the remaining group of sarcomas in soft tissue sarcomas in children are called non rhabdomyosarcoma soft tissue sarcomas. And I'll focus on a couple of recently completed frontline trials conducted in pediatrics and uh, share a couple of uh, patient stories on uh, molecular targeted treatments in this uh, subgroup of patients. So this is what is called uh, an age incidence curve. Uh, of the incidence of soft tissue sarcomas in children. And in this line, the black line represents, uh, you know, the all soft tissue sarcomas, the blue line, rhabdomyosarcoma, and the red line, non-rhabdomyosarcoma soft tissue sarcomas. And on the x-axis, you can see the age and on the y-axis, the, the percentage, and you can see that there is a peak uh, of the non rhabdo soft tissue sarcomas in infancy, and then their incidence is fairly low in the first decade of life, and then it slowly begins to climb and continue to climb after and beyond age 20, where these sarcomas become the most common soft tissue sarcomas in adults. On the other hand, the blue line actually the, the first peak is in the first decade of life when rhabdomyosarcoma is actually most common in young uh, school age children. And then the incidence drops uh, dramatically till uh, at the middle school level and then slowly rises again in the teenage and young adult years, adolescent years. And then it drops off dramatically where rhabdomyosarcoma is a very rare sarcoma in adults. Uh, rhabdomyosarcoma can present um, usually as a lump or a mass somewhere with or without pain and then can affect organ function. Uh, there are, um, it can spread mainly to the lymph nodes. It can also spread through the, love, uh, through the blood and the most common areas where it usually spreads through are usually to the lung, bone and bone marrow and rarely to other organs like the liver. When tumors occur in the paramenangeal region or in the head and neck, it can extend into the central nervous system where it can affect cranial nerves, call, cause erosion of the base of the skull and can extend and grow directly into the area uh, which contains the brain. And that's called intracranial extension. Uh, rhabdomyosarcoma can occur anywhere in the body. And here is a picture of patients of mine over the years. You can see a tumor in the eye or orbit over here, a tumor filling up the nasal passages over here, a very subtle tumor um, on the hand of a child over here. It can occur in the vagina where it's called sarcoma botryoides and it looks like a grape over there. Uh, you can have a paratesticular tumor. This is a newborn baby who had a big lump on the scalp and that's uh, um, also a rhabdomyosarcoma. And you can see a child here where the tumor has spread to the skin and you have these little lumps around over here. There's a child here with a cheek tumor. This is what the cancer looks like in the bone marrow. And when it spreads into the lungs, you can see these large nodules over here. There's a tumor here, which is actually filling up the pelvis of a particular patient. And here, another tumor arising in the bladder, which looks like this coil sitting within the bladder. So why is sight very important in rhabdomyosarcoma? These are survival curves of patients who were treated on the IRS-4 study. IRS stands for intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma and not the internal revenue service. On the, on the, on the x-axis are the years 
uh, for which they survive. And on the Y axis is the number of patients who actually survive. And you can see if you have a tumor which arises in the orbit, you have a very good prognosis. Next, if you have a genitourinary tumor that does not arise in the bladder and prostate, you have the next best prognosis followed by any tumor which arises in the head and neck, provided it doesn't touch the base of skull uh, when it's called a paramenangeal tumor. Tumors that then arise in the bladder prostate region or in any of the extremities or the paramenangeal region or other sites generally do less well. So that's why the site of the tumor is very important and it's included in staging. So rhabdomyosarcoma has a very complicated staging, but it really distills down to these points. If you have a tumor which arises in a favorable site or a site where it's easy to be cured, and those are the orbit, head and neck, as well as the genitourinary system, which is not bladder and prostate, then it's the tumor stage one. If a tumor has spread to other organs in the body, then it's automatically stage four. The next important thing is to think about how big the tumor is when it's first diagnosed. If it's less than five centimeters and the lymph nodes are not involved, then it's a stage two tumor. But if it is of any size uh, with lymph node involvement or any tumor which is larger than five centimeters, then it's considered stage three. And why is staging important? Because as you can see from these survival curves, patients with stage one tumors represented by the pink line have the very best prognosis with approximately 85 to 90 percent of these patients being uh, not having a relapse, followed by stage two tumors represented by the red line, and then stage three tumors having a more intermediate prognosis, while stage four tumors represented by the green line have the worst prognosis of patients. So the next thing which is important is called grouping. And this depends on um, what the surgeon, how the surgeon approaches the tumor when they are first diagnosed. And a group one tumor is when the surgeon has taken out the tumor completely and the pathologist confirms it. Group two is when the surgeon says that he's taken out the tumor completely, but the pathologist says, no, under the microscope, I think you've left something behind. Stage three is when a biopsy only is done. And, stay, and, and group four is when uh, the tumor has spread to other organs. So again, why is grouping uh, important? It is important for the same reason staging is important. As you can see, group one tumors do really the very, very best, while group four tumors continue to do poorly. The next important thing to consider is the histology of what is seen under the microscope for rhabdomyosarcoma. There are two main different two main types of rhabdomyosarcoma. One is called embryonal and the other is called alveolar. And so embryonal tumors are those, and in pediatrics, it, it falls into a group of small round blue cell tumors, and it represents about 70% of the cases. And these cells begin to look like immature muscle cells, and that's where myo comes in in rhabdomyosarcoma. And when they do special staining, these cells over here, um, stain for what are called muscle markers like myoD and myogenin and desmin. The other type of rhabdomyosarcoma really looks like nests of cells and it begins to look like what the normal lung looks like sometimes and that's why it's called alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma and these tumors also express muscle markers, but they are characterized by a very specific gene fusion, which, uh, which represents most of these patients. And these tumors tend to be more aggressive than the embryonal tumors and tend to carry a poorer prognosis. And we'll speak a little bit more about that later. So th these survival figures show you the importance of histology in determining how a patient's gonna do. So if you have embryonal spindle or botryoid histology, you actually have the best outcome. And then if you have alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, then you're 
then the prognosis is not as good and it's more moderate. And these are for patients without a metastatic disease. So between 2003 and 2015, the Children's Oncology Group, which is the largest clinical trials group in the world and conducts uh, clinical trials in children uh, with cancer, children, adolescents, and young adults with cancer, uh, came up with this risk stratification, which takes into consideration stage, group, and histology. And the whole role of this classification is to assign a risk to the patient so we know how best to treat these patients. So patients who have low risk rhabdomyosarcoma are usually treated with milder chemotherapy and for a shorter period of time and they have an excellent prognosis. Usually most of the, more than 90% of these patients are cured. Then you have the majority of rhabdomyosarcoma patients which fall in the intermediate group. And these are tumors which are primarily biopsied only and haven't spread or any patient with an alveolar histology tumor. Those patients are actually treated with uh, aggressive chemotherapy and, and usually have uh, intermediate prognosis where a, between 60 and 70% of these patients uh, can expect to be cured. And then the last group of patients are high-risk patients, and those are patients who have stage four disease and who are over the age of 10 uh, usually, or if they are younger than the age of 10 and they have multiple organs which are involved uh, with rhabdomyosarcoma, and these patients basically uh, are given almost every active drug in the disease, and they still continue to not have a good prognosis. So as you can see, why is risk important? Because again, represented by the pink line is the good risk or the low risk patients. Then the, represented by the blue line over here are the intermediate risk patients. And by the green line, the high risk patients. And you can see that for high risk patients, the chances of long-term survival is still less than 30%. So uh, the alveolar tumors, the majority of them are represented by a specific chromosomal translocation, which is usually a translocation between the second chromosome uh, and a piece of the second chromosome and a piece of the 13th chromosome, where they are sort of broken apart and then they're actually fused. And this, this fusion, when it's actually seen in a tumor with muscle markers, confirms the diagnosis of what we call now a fusion positive rhabdomyosarcoma. And this is really two genes, different genes, the PAX3 gene, which fuses with the FOXO1 gene. And so the FOXO1 fusion is constant, but sometimes the, you can have a different PAX gene, which fuses in with rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, with FOXO1 in fusion positive rhabdomyosarcoma. And why is this also important when you can see over here is if you actually have alveolar histology, but you do not have the fusion, those patients actually do just as well as the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma patients. So we now know that we don't have to treat those patients as aggressively as those who actually have the fusion. And when you actually see the fusion positive patients, all of them are alveolar histology. Those patients have a more moderate uh, prognosis with about 50% of them being cured uh, uh, long term. And there is some information to suggest that if you actually have a PAX7 fusion instead of a PAX3 fusion, uh, the patient might do slightly better. And so now the new classification risk stratification for children's oncology group patients includes the fusion status of the patient. So if you're diagnosed with rhabdomyosarcoma, fusion testing must be done because that determines which group you're actually going to be in. And so you cannot be a low risk patient if you have a fusion positive disease. So all low risk patients must be fusion negative. And, in, and then for stage four patients, uh, those who are less than 10 years of age, 
if they are fusion negative, they actually do quite well and over 50% of them survive. And so we have moved them into what we call the intermediate risk group. And there's an open clinical trial, which is ongoing right now for them. And then for the high risk group, um, any patient who is fusion positive, who has stage four disease, or metastatic disease and any patient who's over the age of 10, uh, if you have fusion negative disease and it has spread, then you're considered high risk. So moving forward to the treatment of rhabdomyosarcoma, it's mainly a combination of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And with this multi-modality approach, the survival of patients has improved from less than 10% to over 70% uh, at this time. The main goal of surgery is to excise the primary tumor right in the beginning, if it is possible, uh, without causing major functional or cosmetic deficits. And this is very challenging in rhabdomyosarcoma. As you can see from those pictures of my patients, it's really hard to take out a big tumor on the cheek of a patient because that would cause a severe cosmetic defect or if a tumor is in an extremity and the only way it would come out is with an amputation. So we don't encourage that. But if a tumor, like for example, a tumor in a testicle in the paratesticular region or a small tumor in the neck, those tumors could be taken out right in the beginning. And in those cases, it really should be done. Uh, sometimes uh, the diagnosis is made out in a community hospital where there's a little lump and uh, the surgeon thinks it's a benign tumor or doesn't know what it is and takes it out and doesn't plan on doing a cancer surgery. So when they're sent into a sarcoma center or a tertiary care center, the most important thing we look to see, is it possible to do another surgery to make sure that the tumor is taken out completely? And then in special sites, like if a tumor occurs in one of the limbs or in the paratesticular region, um, then uh, we sample the lymph nodes because there is a higher incidence of having lymph node metastases in these patients. And sometimes that lymph node metastases cannot be picked up on scans and can only be picked up in pathology. And then the last role of surgery is usually um, when after you've shrunk the tumor down with chemotherapy, before the patient gets radiation therapy, is there an opportunity to go in and do a surgery at that time now that the tumor is smaller? Radiation um, is, is also very effective in rhabdomyosarcoma. And in the studies which were done in the 1990s, there, there was about a 50% relapse rate with radiation therapy in the tumors in the local area, another 17% occurred in the distant, in, 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 the, in the lymph nodes, and then about a third of the patients relapsed far away. So presently patients with group one tumors, those are tumors which are resected completely and which are fusion negative or have embryonal histology, they do not receive radiation therapy. So radiation therapy is usually given anywhere between three and 18 weeks, but we have tried to standardize it to around 13, 12 or 13 weeks right now. And for special sites, depending on the symptoms of the patients, we can either delay radiation therapy, like in the case of vaginal primaries, or sometimes give it earlier in paramenagal primaries. Uh, the treatment is determined by the size of the tumor and the dose is anywhere between 3600 centigrade to 50.4 centigrade. But on a present clinical trial, we are investigating giving large, larger tumors a higher dose of radiation up to almost 60, uh, up to almost 6000 centigrade. And why is radiation therapy very important when you can see over here that when radiation is given to each of the tumors, these are the, this is the control rate of the tumor at the site. And you can see that for, it's, it's really quite effective with 96% of patients controlled if you have an extremity tumor, 95% if you have an orbital tumor, 90% if you have a tumor rising in the bladder and prostate and so on. 
So what is the role of chemotherapy? The role of chemotherapy is local and systemic tumor control. It's usually given with multiple agents. We don't treat with a single agent. The standard in North America is vincristine, dactinomycin, and cyclophosphamide, and that has remained true for over 30 years. There are other drugs which actually work, including arinotecan, topotecan, doxorubicin, etoposide, and ifosfamide. So these are the survivals of the most recent completed clinical trial where patients were treated with vincristine and actinomycin and cyclophosphamide with a lower dose of cyclophosphamide and a shorter duration of therapy. And you can see over here that 88% of patients did not relapse and over 98% of patients with low risk disease are cured. Then when you look at patients in low risk patients who actually had tumor left behind or spread to the lymph nodes, this, this treatment with lower doses of cyclophosphamide did not work as well in preventing relapse. On the previous study, when we gave them higher doses of cyclophosphamide, these patients actually did a lot better. But however, it didn't change the survival, which meant that if they relapsed, you had a higher chance of curing them, uh, which, uh, which was good. But of course, the cost of curing them was much higher because of all the treatment which they had to receive. So now this group of patients has been moved into the intermediate risk so that they can get more intense therapy. This is the last completed trial for intermediate risk rhabdomyosarcoma where patients were randomized to receive VAC only with a lower dose of cyclophosphamide versus VAC together with vincristine and irinotecan. And there was no difference between the two arms of therapy. And so therefore in the presently running intermediate trial, VAC VI is being investigated as the standard arm because uh, to decrease the risk of exposure to cyclophosphamide in patients. But when you look at high-risk patients, even though we gave them every single active drug in rhabdomyosarcoma and added either a new drug called temozolomide or an antibody against IGFR, so it was a targeted therapy for these patients where Dr. Hellman had done a lot of very, very good preclinical work to show the importance of this pathway in rhabdomyosarcoma. Unfortunately, the addition of that antibody as well as the new drug really didn't help these patients much and they continue to do quite poorly despite getting every active treatment. So we really need new or different approaches to these patients to help these patients. But why is treating the patient well in the beginning and having the best outcome really important? That is because if you do relapse with rhabdomyosarcoma, your chances of being cured are very low. And this is a trial which was conducted uh, in patients where we looked at different regimens at, and based on a different risk group and looked at different uh, arinotecan schedules in first relapse patients. And we found that the shorter schedule was as good as the longer schedule. And we learned from that. However, this didn't really help patients, uh, more, more patients get cured. So then we conducted a different clinical trial in first relapse patients to see if we can add on molecular targeted therapy together with chemotherapy. And so half the patients got a chemotherapy regimen of venerelbine and cyclophosphamide together with a drug called bevacizumab. And the other half of patients got venerelbine with cyclophosphamide together with a drug called temsorolimus. And this trial was actually stopped early because the six month survival rate for patients who are on the temsorolimus arm, which is in the red line, was over 65% compared to the bevacizumab arm, which was 50%. And while the patients continue to relapse, there was still a significant difference in those patients who received the drug temsorolimus compared to the drug uh, bevacizumab. And therefore, we are now testing whether temsorolimus can help newly diagnosed patients with intermediate risk rhabdomyosarcoma. Another trial which actually was, uh, was conducted by our European colleagues uh, basically 
looked at standard chemotherapy and at the end of standard chemotherapy, they decided to stop treatment in half the patients but the next, but the other half of patients, they continued treatment with the same relapsed regimen, which we, which we have used in the children's oncology group for six months, but without um, any of the targeted agents. And in this particular trial, uh, not, there was a significant difference for patients in surviving rhabdomyosarcoma if they received maintenance chemotherapy. But note that this was in a select group of patients, many of which have fit into the intermediate risk group for uh, the children's oncology group. There wasn't a statistical difference in preventing relapse. However, it appears that there was a better survival and we're trying, still trying to understand uh, why um, that survival advantage was there for uh, those patients. So the present intermediate risk study, as I said, randomizes patients to uh, VAC VI on the standard arm versus VAC VI and Temsirolimus on the experimental arm. And the study was modified midway to add on maintenance therapy for both arms of the trial and um, based on the results of the European trial. And uh, this study should complete enrolling patients this year or early next year. And we hope to have the results of the study in the next. Um, in the next um, uh, two years. So uh, I'd shown you this picture before for the survival of high-risk patients. Um, they continue to not do well. And so we are trying to understand why this might happen. So right now, there's a big explosion on trying to understand uh, the genetic changes in rhabdomyosarcoma. And you can see over here that um, uh, patients who have a mutation called MyoD1, those patients actually do quite poorly compared to those patients who don't have a MyoD1 mutation. Then if you have a P53 mutation, um, then you also do less well than if you don't have a P53 mutation in these patients, but it's not as, as dismal as a MyoD1 progression. And when you look at different groups based on the risk, so if you include TP53 TP with risk stratification, the patients separate out even more. There is another gene which is called MYCN, which is important in another childhood cancer called neuroblastoma. And it appears to carry a prognostic significance also in rhabdomyosarcoma. And similarly, a drug CDK4, where amplification of both these two genes in patients with rhabdomyosarcoma carry a poorer prognosis than those patients who don't have amplification of these genes. And this information is actually now being used in our low risk patients to see if we can weed out those who would technically relapse and therefore uh, improve the survival of patients who don't have these mutations. So over the years, uh, survival, I, I said, has improved slowly, but it really comes at a cost. In this children's, uh, in the childhood cancer survival study, where you compared survivors of childhood cancer to their siblings, you can see that there was a much higher incidence of long-term side effects or morbidity caused by treatment compared to their siblings who didn't get treated, who also had problems as they got older. And when you look for soft tissue sarcoma, there's a change over here. You can see that it's particularly predominant in patients with soft tissue sarcoma compared to health conditions in their siblings. And so, you know, the problems are really due to where the tumor is located. If you're very young when you got treatment, and then the more intense treatment is for rhabdomyosarcoma. And so, we're trying to limit radiation dose and field. There are not novel surgical approaches being investigated. And we are trying to decrease the doses of uh, chemotherapy in some patients where we think it's actually safe to do so, so that if you do survive rhabdomyosarcoma, you're not burdened with a lot of late effects. 
So moving quickly to non rhabdo soft tissue sarcomas, our approach in these particular patients is very similar to how medical oncologists approach adults with uh, rhabdomyosar with, with soft tissue sarcoma. And you can see there is a big difference in a large number of different cancers which fall into this group and they're all called sarcoma. But and so it's really important to actually know what type of sarcoma you actually have and what your treatment approach is going to be. So the Children's Oncology Group ran a study called ARST0332, which was conducted by Dr. Spunt as the lead investigator. And these results were published last year in the Lancet Oncology Journal, where patients, depending on the size of the tumor or whether you had metastatic disease or not, were offered either observation alone after surgery or surgery and radiation alone for smaller tumors and those which are low grade, which could be completely excised, while those who could not be removed surgically or were high grade and those who were metastatic also got chemotherapy. And when you look in this, the stratification actually worked. So the low risk patients who did not get any treatment had an excellent survival the, other than surgery. The other patients who had disease which hadn't spread to the lymph nodes or hadn't spread to other organs actually had an intermediate survival as predicted. And those who had metastatic disease or the tumor couldn't be removed completely had a poorer survival. This was, there was a second follow-up study to see if we could add a drug called pizopinib to chemotherapy to see if more tumor was killed by adding Pizopinib, and this was also published in Lancet Oncology late last year and was led by Dr. Weiss. In this group of patients, those who received pizopinib and those who did not receive pizopinib, and they also received chemotherapy on both arms. And when you look at this particular trial, those patients who got pizopinib on regimen A actually had more than 90% of their tumor dead. There were higher number of patients in that group compared to those who had less than 90% of their tumor bed. We are waiting to see if this finding translated to better survival in patients. So many of these tumors, um, I will be done in another three or four minutes. Uh, the many of these tumors have many genetic findings and this is a very busy slide to tell you that each of the different types of sarcomas uh, which you see and just call soft tissue sarcoma are really different entities and depending on the tumor there are different pathways and different drugs which could actually benefit some of these patients and so i want to give you a story about how um, a very specific drug for a particular sarcoma could actually benefit a patient. So larotrectinib is a first-in-class drug which inhibits the TREC fusion gene. And there are three different TREC fusions, TREC A, TREC B, and TREC C. And this drug works very specifically. As you can see over here, it only affects one little pathway. And this can occur in children in many, many different areas, but the most common one is an infantile fibrous sarcoma where most patients have this fusion. And you have a very large tumor here on a little baby's or uh, infant's leg. Now, the only thing which we could have done for this was given this patient some chemotherapy and this patient would likely need to have an amputation. But when we saw, when we did a clinical trial, this is what is called a waterfall plot, where if you have a blue line which goes down, those are the patients who responded. And even in a phase one trial where we didn't know whether this drug would work and we were looking to see what the toxic effects were, those patients with these tumors had an incredible response rate. And this is a patient of mine who was one of the first patients treated on um, on this clinical trial, which was a three-year-old child with this large tumor behind the knee. And this tumor did not respond to chemotherapy and actually grew. 
and she had the TREC fusion. So we enrolled her in the clinical trial. And, and, and the only hope for her was actually to have an amputation. And that could be devastating in a three-year-old child. So because she had a TREC fusion, we enrolled her in the trial and she started this medication. And within four months, this was what her MRI looked. The tumor had shrunk significantly. The surgeon was able to take the tumor out completely, saving her leg. And there was no tumor left behind. And so just after four months of treatment, uh, I was able to stop the medication on this patient. And I just saw her in clinic last week. And it was four years and nine months since she had finished her treatment and she was doing very well. And so this, even in the context of a phase one study where, you know, these remarkable results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, as well as in Lancet Oncology. And this led to approval of the drug by the FDA uh, in both adults and children at the same time. Here is another patient of mine who presented with a lump in the neck. You can see it's a very large lump. And that lump filled up the upper part of her chest and her chest. And the small little hole you see here is her windpipe or trachea, which was reduced to the size smaller than a straw. And after treatment with this drug, see the tumor, which was big over here, shrank down to this level. And this big tumor in the lower part of her neck and upper part of her chest shrank down significantly. And you can see her lung has opened up. And she actually made the Wall Street Journal with the title to say that these drugs offer an alternative to chemotherapy. And it's true if you do have a TREC fusion tumor that you should use a TREC inhibitor rather than chemotherapy right now. And so for pediatric sarcomas, I think the main questions are, are there patients where we can limit the morbidity of our treatment? Uh, I think one of our challenges is how do we pick the drug to study because sarcomas in general are quite rare. And in which group of patients can we study these drugs most efficiently? And what is the best method to study them? And given that our tumors are so different, um, we need to begin to think of strategies and how we can treat them more individually and more precisely rather than with a blanket treatment. And with that, I'll stop and get to acknowledge the place where I go to work every day. And I'm inspired by all the patients and their families, which keep us motivated to continue doing what we're doing. Thank you.